Welcome inside the RX Muscle Studios here in New York for another episode of Ask Dave, better known as Hashtag Ask Dave, brought to you by Species Nutrition. Visit SpeciesNutrition.com. I'm your host, Adeep Faruqi. Glad to have you aboard. 30-minute question and answer show with Dave Palumbo. All your questions on diet, training, supplementation, IFBB pros, competitions. We are in the thick of the contest season we are 69 days away from the 2016 Olympia weekend as we bring in Dave Palumbo. And Dave, some big news to announce as far as RX Muscle is concerned with the Olympia. Uh, yeah, we're actually uh, officially going to be uh, invited there this year. Or I don't know if invited is the right term. We're, we're going to have press passes at least. And uh, I reached out to Robin Chang and he kindly uh, said that uh, we would be getting press passes this year and uh, I'm looking forward to that because it's always nice we cover the show usually anyway but it's nice to be able to cover the show the right way with the right access because that obviously gives us the ability to you know be in the right place at the right time and uh, not have to run around like a bunch of uh, uh, I don't know what the Yiddish expression would be Hazes is I think that's the right word but uh, <laughs> isn't that from Scarface <laughs> I don't think so. a pig that doesn't fly straight my grandmother used to call me a Vilda Haya uh, <laughs> I think that means a little maniac who runs around. But anyway, uh, it's going to be nice to be there, especially given the fact that this is a special year with Kevin Lavroni making the comeback and obviously the likes of the big Rami, Phil Heath going for number six. Uh, I'm excited to be going out there. And uh, we'll be, uh, we have a lot of big announcements coming up in the next you know, month or two as to what we're going to be doing in, in the buildup to the Olympia. So, guys, you'll stay tuned for that. So, of course, all your coverage for the buildup to the 2016 Olympian and, of course, uh, contest coverage of the 2016 Olympia, as Dave mentioned, the return of Kevin Lavroni. All your coverage right here on RxMuscle.com. Reminder available now on our YouTube channel and on RxMuscle.com. Yesterday's episode of Iron Rage, the big news yesterday, as first reported by Flex Magazine, that Phil Heath, no longer affiliated with Gifted Nutrition, his brainchild supplement company. Dave and John respond to that news as far as the state of the affairs in the supplement industry. As we now go to your questions, if you want to join us, you can join us on our Instagram, official underscore RX Muscle, on Twitter using hashtag AskDave, our official Facebook page, uh, RxMuscle.com, the Muscle Central Forum, or if you're watching us live on YouTube, on the chat box on the right-hand side of the video screen. Let's go to Scott underscore Bernal. Not sure if there is any relation to Pear Bernal. Hey, Dave, this show sucks. I've seen better coverage from the Camel Crew. Question, will smoking marijuana hinder weight loss during contest prep? I find it hard sleeping on the compounds I'm running. You know, a lot of people ask me about marijuana smoking and bodybuilding. Um, I don't think it's very conducive to bodybuilding. It's not a bodybuilding-friendly drug, put it that way. I know it calms guys down and it relaxes them. I personally would rather see you take a half a Xanax or a, a half a Valium at night, or or if you don't want to use anything prescription drug wise, you know, the, and you don't need anything that strong. Something like my Somalize, you know, nighttime uh, sleep aid is very helpful. Obviously, it contains GABA and melatonin. The problem with marijuana is that not necessarily in that it, it has any negative effect on the bodybuilding directly, but it does. Is it, it causes a lot of estrogen production in the body, so it makes you aromatize more testosterone. Um, if you've ever seen uh, like a real pothead kid in high school, a lot of times they have like boobs, they have like man boobs, because what happens is all the testosterone they're producing gets converted to estrogen and they get gynecomastia from it. There was a kid I, I was roommating with in college who <laughs> had that problem, and I didn't know what it was at the time, but uh, that's, that's what marijuana does. So not a good drug if you're trying to harden up a lot. And I think a lot of bodybuilders that smoke a lot of marijuana notice that they have a lot of trouble getting rid of water and hardening up those last couple of weeks. So... Uh, if, if I was advising you, I'd say don't do it. Let's go to Bensif underscore bodybuilding. Hey, Dave, what do you do for your clients or what did you do for yourself to control water retention in the offseason? I find my feet and ankles swelling as the days go by on the point where my skin is drying out. You really shouldn't hold water that severely, you know, offseason unless you're on your feet all day. I know a lot of guys are on their feet walking around, some guys in the stock market, some guys, you know, uh, they're, they're doing lawn service or, or they're working outside. And, and those guys have water retention just from being on their feet. If you're, if you're not one of these guys that's on your feet all day and you have a ton of water retention, that's not good. That means you're putting a strain on your heart and your kidneys and stuff like that. You might want to check that out. Also, uh, if there's an unequal amount, uh, unilateral 
fluid retention. In other words, if you have fluid retention on one side and not on the other side, that also can indicate some kind of a, a heart issue. So definitely get that checked out. Of course, once in a while, having some fluid retention in the ankles is, is something that we all will experience when we weigh a lot of, you know, when you weigh over 300 pounds. But um, if it's happening all the time, you might want to get some blood work done. Let's go to Mayan67 watching us live on YouTube. If you're watching for the first time on our YouTube channel for the first time ever on rxmuscle.com, hit the subscribe button below. You're not going to miss any of our show segments, updates, and then, of course, with the Olympia upcoming, any of our prejudging videos, any of our wrap-ups, any of our previews, all on our YouTube channel. Let's go to Mayan67. Dave, I have a question based... Uh, question for Dave. Dave, are plant-based sources of saturated fat as bad as animal sources of saturated fat? And he hates the show more than Trump hates China. Okay. Yeah, you know, it's interesting because a lot of people don't realize there are some plant sources of saturated fat, specifically coconut oil, palm oil. Uh, these are technically saturated. The differences are that the saturated fats we get in animal fats are what we call long-chain fats. These need to be processed more. In other words, when they enter the, the cell, uh, before they get into the mitochondria where they get oxidized for fuel, um, they need uh, a transporter. The transporter that transports them into the mitochondria is, is known as L-carnitine. Uh, that's why people think if you take L-carnitine supplementation, it can help with fatty acid burning. Um, the short chain or medium chain fats, which are the ones we find in plants like coconut oil, um, these don't require the, the L-carnitine transporter. So, they call them the fatless fats because what they do is they go directly into the cells and then directly into the mitochondria where they get used as fuel. The problem with saturated plant fats is that they, they're only, the, the only real purpose in the body is for fuel purposes. They're not really essential fatty acids. So to me, when you're on a diet, I, I feel like they're a waste because it's like you're giving your body some energy, but you're really not giving it anything else that it really needs to repair muscle cell membranes or make hormones out of. So they're, they're healthier fats. They're not like long chain saturated fats, but uh, they're good fuel sources, but that's about it. Let's go to I'm a, a, uh, was it? I'm a JN Nutrition. Dave, you already know this, sure, this show is worse than Gift Nutrition without Phil Heath. Nice. Mm -hmm. Question, what's the best way to find a rep, or rather best way to become a reputable guru? Um, you know, a lot of people ask me this uh, question. You know, there's two really ways to do that. One is, is experience. In other words, you, you can't just become a, a, an overnight coach, you know, and, and an experienced overnight coach. It, experience takes time. And the second is knowledge. Okay, so, um, you know, I'm not looking to plug, you know, my, my course I give, but I'm going to plug it anyway because if you want to educate, you've got to educate yourself. And the problem with the Internet is that you don't know what to believe as being true and what's not true. And some of these guys that write stuff on these message boards are out of their freaking minds, you know, with the stuff that they're telling you to do. Uh, and sometimes the most popular people out there are giving the worst advice. I give a course, The Secrets to Becoming a Diet Guru. Uh, we just gave one in June. I have another one coming up August 27th uh, on Saturday here in Westbury, New York at the Arx Muscle Studios. And, uh, you know, you can sign up at DavePalumbo.com. I highly highly suggest you take that course okay because you will learn so much in one day in the 10 hours that i teach that class that you will, your mind will be blown okay and now when you go back and you start working with with clients even though you might have been a coach for 10 years 20 15 years you'll understand the processes that are going on the science behind what's going on you're going to be a better coach wendell floyd you know emailed me the other day you know he's an ipb pro he's been for a while and he's been bodybuilding for over 20 years and he told me you know what because he's looked really good lately on stage. He says, ever since I took your course, I finally learned how to diet properly, you know. And this is a guy who's been doing it for a long time, and he was already a pro. So it's, ne you're never, too, you know, it's never too late to learn more. I'm still learning. You know, even though I teach that class, I'm always adding new stuff in because I'm always learning new stuff myself. Education, very important. Second thing is experience. you got to work with people. No matter how much knowledge you have, you won't be that great the first time out. And you won't be that great the second time out. Well, the third time or the fourth time. But you know what? The more you do it, year after year, you get better. You develop instincts. You start to get your own. You take the knowledge that you learn from someone like me or other people, and you make it your own, and you modify it, and you be, have your own techniques that you employ. And that's really what makes you a great coach. So first, educate yourself. Then get out in the field and get experience. You're watching Ask Dave on RxMuscle.com. Reminder to sign up on the Muscle Central Forum on RxMuscle.com. We mentioned we are in the 
thick of the contest season and with that come the photo galleries in order to access the contest photo galleries you must be a member of rxmuscle.com go right now it is free to register rxmuscle.com let's go to daniel Veluzzi watching us on youtube dave how would you advise to train on keto uh high intensity inter interval training volume also when planning a cheat meal when would you advise to have it and what meal suggestions would you have well you know first of all when you're on a very low carb diet the only restrictions you really have in the gym is is duration Okay, meaning that your endurance is going to be hampered because you don't have as much glycogen in the muscles. So high intensity, low duration, okay, low volume is the best way to grow. I think that's the best way to grow anyway. Get in the gym, stimulate the muscle, and get the hell out of there. Like Lee Haney said, stimulate, don't annihilate, okay? If you're in there for two, three hours, you, you cannot eat, you cannot follow a ketogenic diet. It's going to be, you're going to be exhausted. It's too much. You shouldn't be training that long anyway. I don't know what the hell you could possibly do for three hours in the gym. Uh, I'm not talking about cardio. I'm talking about weight training at this uh, at this point. Now, as far as cheat meals go, I like to recommend people have a cheat meal as one of their last meals of the day. And people may say, well, why? Well, here's what happens. If you have it, let's say you have it first thing in the morning. You go and you go to the pancake house and you eat everything in sight. What if two things is going to happen? Either you're going to cheat the rest of the day because you're going to be like, ah, fuck it, I already screwed up anyway. Or... Or you're going to be stuffed, more likely, you're going to be stuffed the whole day and you're going to miss meals. Now it's not a cheat meal because now it's replacing meals. So we don't want that. We want to replace one meal. Do it at night, okay? This way you go home, you feel guilty, <laughs> you go to sleep, you sleep great because you got all this food in your tummy. You wake up the next morning and you're back on, on the plan again. I think that that's the best way to go. As far as what to eat, I always tell people, pick something you enjoy. But it shouldn't just be all junk food. It should be protein plus something else. You know what I mean? Don't just go to Dunkin' Donuts and Krispy Kreme and, and, and Baskin Robin and just eat all junk. It's got to be a meal, okay? If you want to have a dessert with that meal, fine. I go for all-you-can-eat sushi. I used to, I was in an Italian kick for a while on my, on my cheat meal. I go for Italian food and have pasta and some bread and some, some whatever, chicken parm, whatever I wanted to eat. Uh, other people you know, like to go for burgers and fries at McDonald's or Five Guys. It doesn't really matter, but tr always make sure there's protein in the meal. Let's go to Costas Dr. Steak. Dave, I have a question for you. Is sublingual use of oral steroids less harmful for the liver? Oral steroids are not really going to have that much absorption sublingually. So if you take an Anadrol pill, for instance, and you dissolve it under your tongue, which is going to taste horrendous, by the way, Okay, you might absorb a little bit sublingually, but more than likely, 90% of it you're going to still be swallowing, and that's how you're going to absorb it. So you're not really avoiding liver, any kind of liver or first pass of the liver. Um, you're just basically giving yourself a really bad taste in your mouth. So sublingual uh, delivery systems really are not that great. Even, you know, a lot of people talk to me, some of these uh, rejuvenation clinics a couple years back were doing troches, which is things, little wafers you put under your tongue. They had winstrel wafers and some other Anavar ones. And a couple of uh, clients of mine asked me about them. I said, look, they may be dissolving under your tongue, but you're only, a, you're, you're, the majority of the drug you're absorbing through, you know, your stomach. He's like, but, but I'm uh, dissolving under my tongue. I said, but you're swallowing all the liquid. Only a little bit gets absorbed through the blood vessels under your tongue. The rest you're swallowing down into your stomach and you're going to absorb it through the intestinal tract. So don't bother. Just, if you're going to take an oral, just swallow the whole thing. Let's go to i.mechie. Dave, do you have some good tri good tips for training the lats? I'm way behind, and I feel that I tried a lot of different methods, but my lats do not respond. You know, um, I had a little bit of a trouble growing my back at, at some point in my career. And you know what? The, the best exercise is, and, and I, I wasn't able to do this that far into my career because I got very heavy, but, but pull-ups, believe it or not, are a really good exercise because you really can't cheat. But use pull-ups with straps, like get like a Versa grippers, latch them onto the, the pull-up bar, and just pull right to your chest. I mean, you, you can't cheat. You can't get better than that. One of the most impressive things I've ever seen was Big Sean Allen at over 300 pounds, 6 foot 5, doing pull-ups, like 15 good pull-ups. That was impressive because, I mean, the guy had an enormous back, but the, to be able to pull that kind of weight and with that height he had uh, – that impressed me. Not many people can impress me, but that did. Um, you know, also bent rows is, is really the bread and butter of thickening your back. So if you can do pull-ups and you can do bent rows, you probably don't need a hell of a lot of else uh, to build that back. Let's go to Brandon Dreyer. Dave, Matt Porter recommends 
a pro-inflammatory fats diet for bulking as opposed to anti-inflammatory opinion? Um, just so you guys know, uh, pro-inflammatory fats are your omega-6 fats or a certain percentage of omega-6 fats. There's, there's actually two essential omega-6 fatty acids. And just to take a step back, the polyunsaturated fats are what we call the essential fatty acids. They're called essential fatty acids because your body can't synthesize them on their own. Uh, there's two families of, of, of polyunsaturated fats, the omega-3s, which is our fish oil, which are the anti-inflammatory fats, and the omega-6s. In the omega-6 family, there's two separate essential fats. One is known as gamma linoleic acid, which we find in primrose oil, which is the good anti-inflammatory version. And then there's another one known as arachidonic acid, which is the pro-inflammatory one. It causes inflammation. The pro-inflammatory fat you know, is, is a good stimulus for muscle growth. A little bit of inflammation is good. Excessive inflammation, not so good. So when Matt is talking about, I don't know if he understands this exactly the way I'm explaining it, but um, to say a pro-inflammatory muscle a diet builds muscle is apps is kind of true in a sense but all bodybuilders eat pro-inflammatory diets because red meat and chicken have tons and tons and tons of arachidonic acid in it that's why when i made my essential fatty acid supplement omega lies i didn't put any arachidonic acid in there because we don't need any we get tons of it from the diet we need the the stuff you don't get from the diet the fish oil and the and the gamma linoleic acid which is the primrose oil so um as far as, you know, what kind of a diet the bodybuilders follow, unless you're a vegan, you're eating an inflammatory, your pro-inflammatory diet. Guaranteed, okay? Fish doesn't have a lot of arachidonic acid, but not many people eat fish every single meal and egg whites. Um, that's the old C. Blackman diet, fish and egg whites. Uh, if you eat chicken or if you eat red meat, okay, or if you eat whole eggs, you're getting plenty of arachidonic acid. Let's go to Bonnie JN. Hi, Dave. I'm a female that needs to lose excess body fat but still wants to gain muscle. I'm 5'3", 145 pounds, compete at 120 pounds in women's physique naturally. Your ketogenic diet worked well in past contest prep. What can I do to lose body fat and not lose muscle and maybe gain some muscle too? Should I wait to gain after losing the excess body fat? Well, you got you know, I've talked about this before. You gotta separate the processes. You can't try to gain muscle while you're trying to lose fat. That's, that's silly. Okay, because even if you do add a little bit of muscle, you're going to limit how much muscle you can gain by, by being on a diet at the same time. Why? Because there's a limited amount of resources. When we diet, okay, to lose body fat, we're using a lot of the good nutrients that we would normally use to build muscle as a fuel source. So if you're eating just protein and fat, okay, on a diet, some of that fat and some of that protein is going to get used for energy, okay? Whereas in an off-season scenario, if you're trying to grow and you're eating protein fat and then you're eating some carbs, the carbs get used for fuel and all the fat and protein can get used as, as uh, muscle building, I guess, essential nutrients. Uh, that's important to understand. So don't try to do both at the same time. Um, a ketogenic diet is great for women because women produce a lot of insulin and they're very, very sensitive to holding body fat in their lower body because of estrogen being there. So the ketogenic diet works really well for them. What I've experienced over many, many years of working with people is that women don't lose muscle. You can starve them to death. They don't lose muscle. You could not even feed them. They don't lose muscle. And I think there's some kind of an evolutionary uh, mechanism there, a preservation mechanism, probably desi designed for during times of famine when women were pregnant, that they would have to you know, hold on to their, onto certain fuel. You know, it's funny. I'm a big snake breeder now. Snakes do the same thing. You know, a boa constrictor, you don't feed her and she won't eat for six months while she's pregnant. And you know what? She's fine. Her body preserves the muscle well. She'll lose a little bit, but she doesn't lose as much as you would think she would from not eating for six months, plus aiding to the development of the, of the babies. So women don't lose muscle. Get that out of your head. Diet as hard as you possibly can to lose the body fat. I promise you, you won't, get, you won't lose the muscle. You're watching Ask Dave on RxMuscle.com, brought to you by Species Nutrition. Let's go to Michael Torres. Dave, during the final week of prep, how many pounds does one usually lose when becoming fully depleted before carving back up? Um, I, I, I don't really understand the question. I, I think the question is, when you're depleting, how much weight will you lose before you actually start adding the carbs back in? That depends on what you were eating before. If you were eating carbs in your diet and all of a sudden you pull them out, you'll probably lose a significant amount of weight because you're going to lose a lot of water weight. If you were already on a low-carb diet 
and you pull out whatever remaining carbs might be there, or you might just just deplete you know the last three days before you start carving up. You might not lose much at all. You might lose a pound or two. So it's a hard question to answer. The bigger the person is, the more muscular they are, the more they'll lose when they de carb deplete those three days. So um, it's a loaded question. I don't really know how big you are, what size you are, so it's hard to say. But I would, if I had a guess, I would say anywhere from two to seven pounds. Anthony Reynoso, hey Dave, I hate this show so much, I'd rather hear Steve Blackman talk about how he's growing his magazine with all original content and trying to buy Phil Heath into becoming the first sponsored athlete for his soon-to-be supplement line, MD Nutrition. <laughs> My question is, if a person has a, um, it says serve issue, I'm guessing either a nerve issue, so let's go with, if that makes sense, nerve issue with their uh, thyroid to where the doctor has ran tests and has evaluated that they have very low levels of T3 and T4. Would taking T3 slowly bring it back up? Well, look, if your thyroid gland stops producing thyroxine, which is T4, okay, it, if there's no thyroxine production, then you can't produce T3 because T3 is produced from T4. T4 gets converted to the T3. So if one is not being produced, then you're not producing both. Okay, by supplementing with T3, which is the active thyroid hormone, you're obviously going to start feeling better, but it's not going to necessarily restore your thyroid function. If anything, it might suppress it, it'll probably suppress it more. Um, so you have to figure out why you're not producing it. Now, if there's something wrong with the cells there and they're just not cranking out any more thyroid hormone and, or you're, you have some sort of an autoimmune disease where your immune system destroyed your thyroid, then you probably need to take replacement for the rest of your life. Now. There's two different ways you could take replacement. You can take T4, which is known as Synthroid, um, which is usually what the doctor will give people. And the reason they give T4 is because the body will convert the T4 into T3 as it needs to. In other words, if you give a little too much T4, it doesn't matter because your body will only convert what it needs to T3, which is the active thyroid hormone. If you try to use T3, or which is known as Cytomel uh, in the pharmacy, you have to get very close to exactly what the person needs thyroid hormone-wise. And that's hard to do. It's hard to figure out what the body needs. It's easier to let the body decide what it needs. The advantage of taking T3, however, is that no matter how hard you diet, you're never, <laughs> you're never going to downregulate your thyroid gland because you're always going to have that you know, T3 you're taking on board. Once again, taking an exogenous source of, test, uh, of thyroid hormone, whether it be T4 or T3, is not going to help your natural thyroid production kick back in, however. Good question here from Chris Harris. Dave, at what weight do you think Kevin Lavroni will step onto the Olympia stage? 245. Taz, Dave, certain anabolics tend to leave a swollen lump that comes with redness and pain in the injection sites. I'm sure this is normal, but what is your recommendation? Divide doses? Um, you know, most anabolic steroids don't really leave a big welt or don't leave you sore. Some do. Test propionate leaves you sore. Uh, Winstrel injectable leaves you sore. Uh, those are two known drugs that left you so that leave you sore. I used to try to avoid taking test propionate because it really left me sore. Back in the day, I would use the long-acting esters like enanthate or cypionate. They don't leave you sore at all. Sustanon, which contains test propionate, will leave you sore because of that. Uh, so I would try to avoid those when I was competing, especially at the end of my career when I realized that testosterone, testosterone really doesn't matter. Uh, if you're getting big welts, it could be that you're using an underground lab. It might not be that sterile. They might be using too much preservative in there. Uh, so you got to really figure out why am I, why is this happening to me every single time I'm taking a shot? If it happens once in a blue moon and you maybe got a little inflammation, that's fine. But if it's happening every time, you might want to question your source of what you're using. And, and to do that, you know, you could always use um, the ROID tests that I sell at DavePalumbo.com. Bill Llewellyn developed this kit. Uh, it's, it's designed to test the anabolic steroids you have, and it will tell you exactly what you got. I mean, it doesn't get much better than that. If you're spending a fortune on buying your drugs, you might as well test them to see if what you got is real, especially if you're getting some type of a situation where you're getting inflammation or you're getting infection. You might be taking nothing but just unsterile oil. Jefferson underscore Stark has, hey Dave, I hate this show so much that if you don't answer my question, I will have, and this is in all caps, Dave Palumbo hates my mother tattooed across my forehead. I should just not ask this question just so you get that tattoo, take a picture of it, 
it'll be great, but I will because I'm a nice guy. Dave, why is it okay for these YouTube fitness gods to doctor their physiques and the thumbnails for their videos while guys like Devin Shreds get crucified for doctoring his Instagram pics? Isn't it the same thing? It's, it's the same reason that if I sold uh, some of these pre-workouts with the illegal stimulants in them, that I would be in jail tomorrow, whereas other guys out there could sell them for years and years and years and make tons of money and, and never get in any trouble whatsoever. Depends on who's targeted. He's a well-known celebrity, you know, if, uh, I guess you could say social media celebrity. So he's going to get targeted because he's more well-known than some of these other idiots who, who aren't well-known, who doctor him up and no one even knows the better of it or no one cares. That's really what it amounts to. People, if they care enough that to criticize you for doing something, then you know you're doing something right. Obviously, Devin has done something right, has made a name for himself. People know who he is, so they're going to scrutinize him more. I did it. I hate to bring the uh, reptiles. I know Sid cringes every time I mention reptiles. I have I breed ball pythons, and I was I did a, a video where I was cutting eggs. You know what we do is right about two days before the eggs hatch, you cut a little window in the top of the egg. You peek in there and see what's in there. This way, when it's time to hatch, the, the snake doesn't get stuck in the egg, and they can come out more easily. I, I was doing it. I had very little patience. I was doing it very quickly, and I posted this video on, on this reptile on my YouTube reptile channel, and all the reptile people were crucifying me. They were they were screaming at me like I was abusing animals because I was cutting these eggs too quickly they thought or too rough I was handling them too rough you would think that I was like abusing a dog with a baseball bat or something like that and I took that as a compliment because I could have put up the video and no one could have watched it and people could have given a shit but I actually had all these people caring enough to yell at me meaning that they obviously liked what I was doing uh, on that on the on these uh, on these videos and they were watching my videos so it just goes with, the, with, it goes with the territory. If you're very popular, you're under the microscope. Patrick Bissoni, Dave, will you keep your gains from one test cycle after coming off, or will you lose most of them? If you stop training hard and you eat like crap after you come off the, the drugs, which some people do because they only train hard and eat right when they're on drugs, you'll lose the gains. If you continue to train hard, eat right, and, and, and it reinforce your... Uh, your, your, uh, I guess you could say your supplement program with, with good nutrition, you'll keep everything. You know, you might deflate a little bit, but you'll keep most of it. Game underscore changer 405. Dave, I, ha I have an issue. Whenever I eat carbs before bed, I wake up the next day full and big. However, my waist also seems to grow. But when I don't eat carbs before bed and just have protein and some fats, I'm flat as a pancake the next morning. What should I do? Maybe you should go somewhere in the middle. You know, <laughs> don't overeat the carbs. Have a little bit of carbs with the fat and protein. You'll wake up perfect, right? It's like Little Red Riding Hood. You know, just you know, right. If it's too hot, too cold, you know, just right. Let's go to Louis Zito. Dave, my test is low, and I want to start TRT, but I'm young and plan on having kids in the future. Should I try Clomid or HCG first, or just use them with my test to keep fertility? You know. When a woman goes on birth control pills, she doesn't worry about whether she's fertile while she's on the birth control pills because she doesn't want to get pregnant, right? Same thing when you're on a cycle, don't worry about it. You're trying to grow muscle. You're not worried about being fertile. When you get off the cycle, okay, you can take your HCG and Clomid to restore your, your fertility or f restore your natural testosterone production. The body works on a feedback loop, and I told people this before. I took anabolic steroids for 13 years. I took hormone replacement for 10 years after that. I stopped the hormone replacement and I went on HCG and Clomid, and I got my wife pregnant in three months. So the body is very resilient. It will turn itself on and off. Don't try to do both things at the same time. It's a waste. Let's go to Doug Adams. Dave, I'm curious as to why you don't want to be big anymore. Uh, it doesn't serve a purpose. You know, for me, being big was never about uh, I just want to be the biggest guy because, because I feel insecure about myself. For me, being big once I started competing was, was because I wanted to be a great bodybuilder. And I knew that, that being that big was probably not the healthiest thing I could do for my body, but I was so obsessed with the goal of being, you know, the best bodybuilder I could be that that was, that was my, what I was focused on. That was important to me. Once that wasn't my goal anymore, my goal was to provide great content and programming for you guys here on RX Muscle to create a, a high quality, you know, supplement line and species nutrition. I realized that I didn't need to be that big anymore. Matter of fact, it was neg it was a negative for me to be that big because it was it was it was raising my blood pressure. It was I had to eat you know every freaking two hours. 
uh, it was a pain in the ass. Actually, it was it was it was a pain in the ass to travel and sit in a car seat or or to sit in the airplane seat. So I downsized, and I realized, hey, you know what? I'm in my 40s. I need to lower my body weight. I still want to be ripped, and I still want to look healthy, and I want to feel good, and I want to be able to move around well. But I don't need to be – that's not that functional to be that big. So you always have to recreate yourself and change your goals. If you try to be the guy you were when you were 20, you're going to have a short life, number one, and you're going to be unhappy because you can never get back to the splendor you had at 25 years or 30 years of age when you're in your 40s or 50s. It, it's, it's foolish to believe that you can still go back to that. And I think it's detrimental to the health. And it, you know what it is? It stagnates your growth, I think, as a person. you got to keep finding new things that you're passionate about, new goals you can set for yourself that are in alignment with who you are at this point in time. Let's go to Johem1201. Hey, Dave, I'm not a bodybuilder, but I'm very interested in human anatomy and physiology. I was wondering what the effects of IGF-1 are when not, when not used with testosterone. Well, you know, IGF-1 is a is a muscle repair type enzyme. When when the cells get damaged, uh, mechanically speaking, in the gym, uh, they they release you know local acting you know IGF-1. It's also known as mechanical growth factor. But then there's also a, a uh, there's a release of systemic growth hormone, and that growth hormone goes back to the liver, and then the liver releases systemic IGF-1. But what what the purpose of this is is that the damaged cells produce receptors on the cells that are damaged. They produce IGF-1 receptors. Why do they do this? So that they, they can signal to the body, hey, we're damaged here, we need help. Now the IGF-1 that's released into the circulation, both systemically and locally, know where to go. They have a target. Hey, there's receptors. Let's bind onto these receptors and get into the muscles. Once the IGF binds to these receptors, they now instruct the muscle to start repairing itself using either um, satellite cells, which are undifferentiated stem cells, to make new muscle cells or to repair the actual muscle that, that, that's actually there. Um, this happens whether you take testosterone or not. However, what does testosterone do? Testosterone makes the muscle fibers grow, hypertrophy, faster. The more testosterone you have, to a certain degree, the more you will get more hypertrophy. So the testosterone will work synergistically with the IGF-1 together with it to enhance muscle growth. But if you don't take the testosterone, you're still going to get the muscle effects of the IGF-1. Let's go to Brodaz Fitness. Hi, Dave. I hate this show as much as I hate Kai not doing the Olympia. Could you tell us biochemical reasons for long esters causing more water retention? Well, the longer you're exposed to a testosterone ester, okay, the more likely you are to get the side effects. And, and what are the side effects of testosterone? Well, there's not that many side effects of testosterone, but there is side effects of estrogen. The longer the testosterone hangs around the body, the more likely it is to aromatize or convert into estrogen, and then the estrogen will make you retain fluid. Make sense? If you have short-acting esters that aren't around long, like testosterone propionate esters or, 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 or testosterone suspension esters, what happens is, the aromatase enzyme doesn't have time to work on those a lot of times, and you don't get as much estrogen conversion, so you have less fluid retention. Personally, if you take an aromatase inhibitor like a Raminex or a Femara or a Romacin, it becomes a moot point. That's why I believe in using long-acting esters, because as long as you've you got those aromatase inhibitors on board, you're not going to produce the estrogen anyway. Ben Cooling, what's Dave's view on injectable versions of orals? Look, oral compounds like Anadrol and Dianabol and Anavar were made orally for a reason. They're, they're, they're more potent that way. The only injectable version of, a, of an oral that I've seen that, that seems to work better, maybe, uh, dare I say, is injectable Dianabol. For some reason, it works really good when you inject the stuff. Uh, it doesn't kill your appetite at all. You feel strong on the stuff. But other than that, I have not seen any of the other orals work better in injectable form. I think that they're, they're more potent orally. Now, Winstrel uh, and Winstrel injectable are the same compound. They're not different. They're just, basically, it's just sterile Winstrel in water. Um, so they pretty much have a similar effect. The injectable version having a little less liver toxicity because it only has to pass through the liver once. But any kind of short-acting, you know, injectable like Winstrel, you know, is, and Winchell Depot is going to have a little top more toxicity anyway because it's in and out of the system so quickly. So, once again, orals are orals, injectables are injectables. Don't try to combine the two. Time for two more questions. Let's go to Adam James Cooper. 
Uh, does far cells suck up carbs and water as my skin can be soft, smooth, or even wobbly looking when I seem to take in much carbs? Also, does vitamin C work as a diuretic? Um, I, I didn't hear what the, what the first so, yeah, word said. He goes, does far cells, and there's a suck up, carbs and water as F my... Spell the far cells. Yeah, F-A-R. F-A-R cells? Yeah. Fat cells, maybe? May possibly. Let's go with that. All right. So what? So what if? <laughs> so, okay. So it, so let's go with. Let's repeat the question with fat. Does fat cell, do fat cells suck up carbs and water as my skin can be soft, smooth, or even wobbly looking when I seem to take in much carbs? Well, what you know, carbs do is when carbs are stored as glycogen in the muscle, they pull fluid with them. Okay, but. Carbs going into the fat cells and getting converted to the fat don't really make you whole water, although they make you whole fat. So um, carbs in general, though, however, will make you bloated. That's why a lot of people, when I, have put these, when I put women on ketogenic diets, my ketogenic diet, they love it because they don't retain any fluid, okay, which is, which is something that, that drives women crazy, I think, when they hold a lot of water. So it's a, that's a great reason not to eat carbs. Now, as far as vitamin C goes, yeah, if you take excessive amounts over 3,000 milligrams a day, you're going to have a slight diuresis effect uh, from the vitamin C because you're peeing out the extra. Um, I wouldn't use vitamin C necessarily as a diuretic. I think there are better herbal diuretics. I, I produce a product called Aqualyze that uses uva ursi and some dandelion root, and that stuff works really, really good if, if that's an issue you have. Um, so I, I don't necessarily – I wouldn't use vitamin C as a diuretic. Tony Low, uh, I'm sorry, I'm going to butcher this name, Lo Sicaro, Lo Sicaro. Dave, when the top pros work with the top gurus, he mentions Aceto, Hani, yourself, what kind of money are they paying them? And also, who's paying for the coaches, hotels, and travel, etc. when going to shows? I think everyone has different arrangements with their athletes. Uh, a lot of my athletes like to use me because they know I'm at a lot. Well, I used to be at every show, but I'm, I'm at a lot of the big shows now, so they don't really have to pay for me. I know like Chris Aceto has a lot of his clients will fly him into different places depending on where they want him to be, especially if there are other countries. Uh, everyone charges different amounts of money. Uh, I'm probably one of the cheaper guys out there, I think. Uh, Chris has very few clients, so he charges a little more, but I, I know Hani's is pretty expensive too. So yeah, once again, you know, I don't. I'm a coach, and I love coaching, and I'll never stop because to me, it's it's a passion I have. But it's not my main source of income. So for me, I don't feel like I need to uh, charge people a huge amount of money. I want. I like to be affordable so that a lot of people have access to me and and can use me. People like Chris don't need the money either, so he'd rather just have just people who are super, super serious and who are at an elite level. That's what he likes to work with. He doesn't really like to work with just novice people, whereas I, I enjoy that more because I like to, I'm like more of a teacher. I like to teach people. Chris likes to strategize and, and, and get in the, in, into the mindset of the whole you know, pro type of thing. And that's why there's different coaches for different people, and I think that's what's great about it because there's so many people competing in today's you know, uh, bodybuilding industry that there's a coach for everyone out there. And you've got to find a coach that you're comfortable with and that you could work with and that you feel and that you resonate with because that's the guy that's going to be there or girl that's going to be there for you, you know, right down to the dot, right down to the wire. And that's the person that's going to have to save you if something goes wrong. So you better feel comfortable working with the coach. Know they have the knowledge that they need to provide you with help if you do get into trouble and that can problem solve, especially if you have a difficult metabolism. Someone with a gifted metabolism could be used, they could probably use anyone as a coach and get in shape. But that's not the usual that's a very rare percentage of people. James Copsell wants to know if you hold a common belief that if one builds his wings, his lats enough, he or she might actually be able to fly. Very nice. All right, let's go to Body by Jake94. Dave, I hate this show so much. I'd rather have Steve Blackman being my loan officer, yelling at me why cut back when <laughs> applying for student loans. Prepping for a local NPC bodybuilding show. Good one here. Any tips on bringing out better quad separation? Look, separation is just a mere fact of diet, okay? It's really what it is. The lower your body fat, the more separation you're going to show. Now, having said that, when you get in the best shape of your life and you still don't have deep enough muscle grooves, 
if that's what we want to call separation. That could just be a lack of muscle maturity. You haven't been training long enough. You don't have enough muscle there to really, or enough development to show off the, you know, the real nuances of the muscle. Or it could just be a genetic thing. I've seen Kai Green in the offseason at 315 pounds, flex his quad, and he's got separation, but yet he's got body fat on his body. So there is a genetic component to muscle separation, but most of the time it's just a factor of how much body fat you got on you. Take one more question. He does ask questions, good questions, every episode. So I want to get at him in. Wolf of Essex, what are the solutions and oils that testosterone and other anabolics suspend in? More importantly, do any of these oils get absorbed by the body as fuel and hence calories? I'm wondering if there is every scenario where one needs to adjust their diet and lower the amount of fat they consume if these oils do get used as fuel. Well, yeah, I mean, they're, all the oils, cottonseed oil is, is a big you know, a lot of the steroids use that. They're all used for fuel eventually, okay? But we're, most people inject the CC here and there. Uh, if you're Boston Lloyd and you're using, you know, 100 cc's a week, you probably are <laughs> increasing your caloric load a little bit. But for most people, it's a negligible amount. It's such a small amount. That is going to do it for this episode of Fast Dave, brought to you by Species Nutrition. Visit speciesnutrition.com. For Johnny Styles and Dave Palumbo, I'm Sadiq Faruqi. We'll see you next week.